Okay, I think we can start. So, hey guys, my name is Batista. I'm a full stack engineer here at AE. And whoops, I'll give you guys an introduction on NFT and its, technolo and its technologies. Sorry. So, first of all, before we start like digging up in the NFT world, yeah, I think it's good for us to understand what is a blockchain because NFTs they run on blockchains and most people I think they don't they don't have the basic understanding of what is a blockchain and what is important to understand blockchains to understand NFTs and for the purpose of a better explanation on blockchains I'll, I'm the proud owner of a blockchain myself so let me put my on blockchain so I can demonstrate you better what is a blockchain so guys this is a blockchain and okay that's all you need to know about blockchains this is a blockchain no just kidding <laughs> a <bl> a <laughs> going back to the presentation a blockchain is a public database that is updated and shared across many computers in the network and a block refers to data and state being stored in consecutive groups known as blocks. If you send F for someone else, the transactions, the transaction that needs to be added to a block to be successful. And a chain refers to the fact that each block cryptographic, cryptographically, sorry, that one is hard, refers to its parent. So in other words, each block is chained to its parent, just like in a chain. So the data in a block cannot change without changing all subsequent blocks, which would require the consensus of the entire network. So we have the concept of blocks and the chain. So we store transactions in blocks and we link blocks to their parents, forming a chain. The guys that store the blocks are the nodes. Every computer in the network that must agree to a new block to put on in the chain is a node. These computers will ensure that everyone interacting with the blockchain has the same data. So every node has a copy of all the state of the blockchain, which is pretty cool. And these this make like the blockchain safe because everyone shares the same data and everyone agrees what is the true state of the blockchain. So and to agree what is the true state of the blockchain, blockchains need a consensus mechanism. Ethereum and Bitcoin currently use a proof of work consensus mechanism. This means that anyone who wants to add new blocks to the chain must solve a difficult puzzle that requires a lot of computing power. That's what people have been talking about blockchains because they consume a lot of energy because these puzzles are getting harder and harder as the blockchain grows. So they ended up consuming a lot of energy and a lot of resources. So blockchain are trying to move from proof of work to proof of stake instead of like solving a puzzle and and like wasting a lot of energy you can prove a stake you can own like coins you can own the cryptocurrency of a given coin to prove that you are a trustee worker on the blockchain but solving a puzzle to a blockchain that is based on proof of work will reward you with some tokens from that blockchain if you might if you do some work for the bitcoin blockchain you ended up like gaining some bitcoins if you do some work for the ethereum blockchain they'll reward you with f and this is known as mining when you heard about people talk about mining it's like people that has powerful computers validating transaction and creating blocks new blocks and putting their these new blocks in the blockchain is it it could be Ethereum or it can be Bitcoin or any other blockchain that is based on proof of work. So mining is typically brute force try and error, and but successfully adding a block is rewarded some coins. So this is one way to mine some coins. There, there's another way that I'll talk later. Moving on, what is Ethereum and why I'm going to talk about Ethereum? Because Ethereum was the first block, blockchain to support NFTs. Nowadays, we have Flow and we have also Cardano that support, that support NFTs. But as Ethereum, together with Polygon, are the most common solution to NFTs project. I'll be talking about them. Also, we'll have a presentation later today about the Flow blockchain. 
So in the Ethereum universe, there is a single canonical computer called the Ethereum Virtual Machine, whose state everyone on the network agrees on. This canonical computer means that a group of computers form a unique computer known by the Ethereum Virtual Machine. Every Ethereum node keeps a copy of the state of this computer, this, this canonical computer that doesn't actually exist and broadcast a request for this computer to perform arbitrary computations. If you want to talk to the Ethereum blockchain, you actually talk to the EVM, the Ethereum virtual machine. Requests, requests for computation are called transaction requests. It's the famous transaction we always heard about on the Ethereum in the blockchain universe. Every time we want to talk to, a, to the EVM, you would make a transaction request. Cryptographic mechanisms ensure that once transactions are verified as valid and added to the blockchain, they can be tempered. So they run a series of cryptographic algorithms to ensure that no one can change the last transaction. And as the blockchains are, transactions are stored in blocks and blocks are linked to their parents. If you change a given block, you need to change all the subsequent blocks and make it the whole blockchain agree with you that you want the truth, the new true state. So that's quite hard to, to forge a transaction on a blockchain. And the same mechanism that also ensured the same mechanism that ensured that a, all transactions are signed and executed with proper permission. So the same algorithm mechanism that ensure that a transaction is true to ensure that you have the proper permission to, to start a transaction. No one will be able to send digital assets from my account except for me. So the blockchain ensures that only me can, only I can change my own assets. So only me, so only I can change, send some tokens for, for another person. And account is where ethers or bitcoins or any other cryptocurrency are stored. Users can initialize an account, deposit some crypto cryptocurrency, some crypto coins on a given account and transfer from their account to the other to other users. In the Ethereum blockchain, Ether is the native cryptocurrency of Ethereum. So its purpose is to allow for a market, to offer a market for computation because like running a machine is not for free. You need to pay for the hardware, will pay for your electric bill. So people will not be willing to work for free or put their, their computers and the, the electric bills on the line for free. So blockchains, they have native tokens so they can award people for their work. And in the Ethereum blockchain, the native crypto currency is the Ether. So every time you want to broadcast a transaction to the blockchain, who also you will need to offer a bounty for people to process your transaction because probably no one will be willing to work for free. And we also have smart contracts. Smart contracts are a snippet of reusable code, just like Lambda functions, you can associate if you're a software developer, that lives in the EVM storage. Users can make requests to execute the code snippets with variant parameters. Any developer can create a smart contract and make it public to the network. And any anyone can call them, they can call the smart contract to execute this code. Both people, the one deploying and the people calling the smart contract will pay a fee to the network. So this fee will be some amount of effort that someone would, would take for processing your processing your transaction, executing your code in your machine, executing your smart contract, and there'll be a ward with the small bounty you are offering them. And we can now talk a bit about of NFTs. NFTs are tokens that represent ownership of unique items. So NFTs are based on smart contracts. I'll be talking a bit more about them. But to wrap things up until and the point we are now, we have the blockchain that is a chain of blocks that are consisted by a group of transactions that was then people 
let me try to summarize this in a better way. <laughs> it's quite confusing. But every time you want to talk, you want to talk to the blockchain, you start a transaction, you pay a small fee to someone to execute your transaction or run your code in your smart contract. And then this, this given person will put your transaction in the block and someone else will then take the block and put it in the blockchain. Usually it, this can be the same person, but usually a different person. So you can make some money, you can mine some coins, processing transactions for users when they call their smart contract, or you can make some money taking a bunch of transactions, put it in a block and put it in the block in the blockchain. So with this knowledge in mind, we can come to the NFTs that are the tokens that represent unique items. They let us tokenize things like art, collectibles, and even real estate. They can only have one official owner at a time, and they and they are secured by the Ethereum blockchain. No one can modify the record of ownership or copy paste a new NFT into its existence. NFT stands for non fungible token. So non fungible is an economy term that you could use to describe things like your furniture, a song file, or your computer. These things are not interchangeable for other items because they have unique properties. Fungible items, on the other hand, can be exchanged by their definite can be exchanged because their their value defines them better than the unique properties. For example, F or dollar are fungible because you can trade one F or one dollar for another one F or one dollar. And an NFT can only have one owner at a time. Ownership is managed through the unique ID and the metadata that no one other token can replicate. NFTs are minted through smart contracts or piece of softwares that run in the blockchain that assign ownership and manage the transferability of the NFTs. When someone creates or mints an NFT, they execute code storage in the smart contract that conforms to different standards, such the ERC-721. Most NFTs are built using a consistent standard uh, known as ERC-721. However, there are another standards that you might want to look into. The ERC-1155, a standard that allows for semi-fungible tokens, which is a particular useful in the realm of gaming. You can have one token that's for your game that's super hair, that it's one out of one, a super powerful sword, or you can have common items that are like one out of 100, and you can support them in the same smart contract with 1155 contract. And more recently, there is the EIP 2309. There's a proposed for making as has been proposed, sorry guys, to make minting NFTs more efficient when you can we'll be able to mint a lot of NFTs in one transaction. To make things clear, when you mint an NFT, you can only mint one NFT per transaction, and you pay every time you create a transaction, you pay a gas, you pay a small amount of bounty, you pay a amount of money, a small amount of crypto in the blockchain, so your transaction can be processed in store and the blockchain. So this can be quite expensive. If you are trying to mint one or two NFT, it's probably not be like that expensive. But if you have your own marketplace and you mint hundreds or thousands of NFTs per day, that can get quite expensive, especially when you work with the Ethereum blockchain, because F, the cryptocurrency of the Ethereum is super expensive right now. So this can get quite expensive. That's why people are trying to improve the NFT standards, so make them cheap and more efficient. And with NFTs come what we call the apps or dApps. They're, they are decentralized application. They combine a smart contract and the front end user interface. This is what usually we, we see on marketplaces as OpenSea, they're usually Denomine as a D app because they run, they have a client side interface, but they run most of their logic. It could be better if they use or run all their logic on the blockchain, but it know, we know that it's not what they do. 
but they run their logic on the blockchain. They keep their they source of truth on the blockchain. Let me see. I think I went a lot faster than I should in all of this because I get to what I need to create an NFT. But this is the part when it gets quite confusing. So <laughs> I will try to be a lot slower than I was until now. So what do I need to create an NFT? Or what do I need? What should I need from people to create an NFT if I'm trying to hire someone to mint NFTs for me or to create the apps, work with blockchain based applications? So to create an NFT or an the app based network, this all you need at least these tools most of the time. You need tools like Alchemy, Infuria, MetaMask, Hardhead, Truffle, Solidity, Ethers, or Web3, and Pinata. I'll describe all of this for you guys. And I hope you guys don't have a lot of doubt of, of, what, of what is a blockchain so far. I know maybe I was too fast in my presentation. I'm a bit, bit nervous. Sorry about that. But I hope you guys learned the basic of what is a blockchain and so I can describe better what is an NFT. An NFT is it's a token living in the Ethereum blockchain is a so just like the F that is a token that lives in the Ethereum blockchain, NFT are also a token, but a different one that lives in the blockchain. And they have something called metadata that describe these NFTs and this that what makes it they're truly unique. So I'll describe what do I need to create an NFT. So first of all, we'll need a node because as we talked before, blockchains, they run on nodes that are computers processing transaction, creating blocks and putting blocks in the blockchain. So to communicate with the Turing chain, we'll need a node and run your own node can be quite hard and expensive because we'll need a super powerful machine that's quite hard to maintain. So platforms like Alchemy and Infura allow you to communicate with blockchain without running your own node. They usually call node providers. We will also need an account. So MetaMask is a virtual wallet in the browser used to manage Ethereum accounts. Because every time you create a transaction, you will need to, to pay a small fee. And to pay a small fee, you will need a wallet with some money in it. And after we have our node provider or account, we'll need to compile, deploy, test, and debug your Ethereum software, your smart contract. For that, we have hard hat or truffle. There are development environment that help developers when building smart contracts and the app locally before deploying to the live chain. So you can test your code, you can test your piece of code, your smart contract before you deploying to the blockchain. So you don't need to pay gas fees just for testing it. There are test networks. You don't need to go full like production mode in the blockchain world, but it's it's quite slow to do test live. So we have these tools that help us develop our smart contracts. And you will need also to write your contract because and for that you need Solidity. Solidity is the programming language used to write smart contracts. So contracts in Solidity are similar to classes in object-oriented languages. So, oh, let me see that I'm good. That is what I was about to ask. How is the DevM? So we use Hardhat and Truffle to compile the Solidity contract. So these, a Solidity contract is similar to some like class, some classes in oriented object languages. So each contract can contain declarations of state variables, functions, function modifier, events, errors, struct types, and NM types. And they can also generate other contracts. So we can have one contract that generates another contract. So your contract will need to implement the ERC721 standard to be considered an NFT. If you want to create an NFT, you it's mandatory to implement all the methods in the standard ERC 721s. You can check that in the in the Ethereum org website. So, but 
you don't need to worry about like implementing a lot of interface you never heard about. You can check openzeppelin.com. They provide open source implementation of these and other NFT contracts, NFT standards, sorry guys. So they're battle tested. You don't need to worry about like making your contract secure because other people have been doing it for quite some time and you can have them for free, which, which is awesome because when you're dealing with smart contracts with with the apps usually we're dealing with people's money so everything needs to be battle tested and super safe so luckily we have open zeppelin these amazing people that been doing this for a while been testing implementing and make these smart contracts secure and public which is awesome and after we have our node, our account, we have our contract written, insulated, and then compiled with hard hat or truffle, deployed to the blockchain, to the Ethereum blockchain, or any other Ethereum compatible blockchain as Polygon, we can finally mint the NFT. Usually people, when we talk about creating an NFT, people say that it will mint a NFT, an NFT. So Minting an NFT is the act of publishing a unique instance of a ERC-721 token in the blockchain. Libraries like Ethers and Web3 will make easier to interact, make easier to interact and make requests to the Ethereum blockchain by wrapping the JSON RPC standard methods with more friendly methods. When we talk to the blockchain, when you talk to the EVM, the Ethereum virtual machine we usually will be using json rpc requests and they are not super user friendly so we have libraries like ethers and web3 that will wrap these json rpc requests and user friendly methods so we can use it we can talk to the blockchain by simply calling a method and not writing a, a weird json file and talking a bit more about the erc721 Standard one of its interfaces is the IERC 721 metadata. It allows us, <laughs> it allows you to store a URI to a JSON document describing the NFT metadata, which is really what brings the NFT to life. It allows you to have configurable properties such as name, description, image, and other attributes. So to, when we mint an NFT, we send a transaction to the blockchain calling our ARC721 contract and we call usually we call the mint methods and pass as a parameter the URI a an address to a JSON file containing all the metadata of our NFT and that's what brings the NFT to life. And to store the NFT metadata we usually to make it fully centralized, it's recommended that you store your NFT metadata, your JSON file, in an IPFS. An IPFS is an interplanetary file system. It's a decentralized protocol and a peer-to-peer -peer network for storing and sharing data in a distributed file system. And for that, we have Pinata. Pinata is a convenient IPFS API and toolkit, so you can send JSON files or any kind of file to an interplanetary file system and have a unique ID, a unique ID for, your, for your asset that will work across any IPFS provider, such as Pinata or any other provider that you may willing to use. So this is all the tooling that we need to create a simple NFT of a, a Neon Cat GIF. I'll show you guys a snippet of code and go it like line by line so we can exemplify it and wrap things up and make it you know a bit more understandable but if you are not a tech person you but you but you work with human resources you are and you need to hire someone to work with nfts and work with the apps usually we'll look for people skill on those on those like tools with Alchemy, Infure as node provider, or any other old node provider, but Alchemy and Infure are the most popular ones. With MetaMask as a wallet provider, because usually it's the de facto 
like wallet provided when you work with the apps, hard hat and truffle as the development environment for smart contracts. If you can have someone that has knowledge in Solidity is awesome. So we have Hifini here at the company that knows a lot about Solidity and it's awesome to have him. We also may need someone that knows a bit about Ethers and Web3.js so you can, you can make requests easier to the blockchain. Usually when you have a D app, a, J, a JavaScript based app, we'll probably be using Ethers or Web3.js and Pinata as a PFS storage, not mandatory, but it's a, it's a good to have thing on your, on your NFT or your blockchain project. So let me see, um, I thought I, will, um, I still have plenty of time to, to go through this weird snippet of code here that will wrap all that I've been talking about. So in the first line, we have our Web3 instancy that uses our Alchemy node provider. So to have a Web3 instancy, we'll be using the Alchemy JSON RPC API address. So we have this node provider that gives us access to the JSON RPC from our blockchain. And we use the Web3 library to wrap this JSON RPC request into user-friendly methods. Then we need an instancy of a contract. The contract we've written on Solidity and then we compile with hard hat or truffle and deploy to the blockchain. And with the compiled Solidity code, we can then get our ABI. The ABI is a contract application binary interface. It's an interface that specify how to interact with a specific, <coughs> sorry, guys, Ethereum contract. Includes method names, parameters, constants, and data structures. Everything we need to know about a contract is a massive JSON file. And that describes your contract. So yeah, you see a lot of, of code later we finish presentation just to make things clear. I'm not digging into like code. I'm not giving a, you a, a live presentation. I'm here to introduce you to concepts that we need then will give you a hands-on like presentation who creates some NFTs for you guys. But with this, I, I think a lot as a software developers looking at the code, it makes a lot easier for me to, to explain to you guys how these all these moving parts connect and why it's so it's not that easy to, to create an NFT. It's not super something like super trivial. <clears throat> Even for software developers with a lot of experience, because we have a lot of moving parts just to create an NFT. So, so far we created our Web3 instance that depends on a node provider that will give us the JSON RPC APIs. And then the Web3 library will make it easier for us to call these JSON RPC APIs. We need a contract instance that again, the Web3 library will give us the contract instance using the contract AV <coughs> ABI that we get it from our Solidity code that was compiled with Ether or Hardhat. And we'll need the contract address when you deploy the contract to the blockchain, we'll get the contract address that it works just like a wallet address. And we'll need a your your asset that could be an image, a music file, anything. Usually we be we'll be using a IPFS to store this this file. So we'll be using Pinata as our IPFS provider. So we'll use the I in the community the we use store the hash, the CID of the file inside the metadata file of our NFT. So we'll send our asset or image to the IPFS, get the IPFS hash, create a metadata file, a JSON file, then describing the name, giving it a description and linking the asset <clears throat> IPFS hash, the IPFS CID 
to our metadata file. Then we send our metadata file. We also send it to the IPFS. So, I, so we make it fully decentralized. We then store the IPFS hash of our JSON file that we've sent to the IPFS. We create then with our Web3 library, we start creating our transaction. We get what is called a NUNS, that is a unique ID for each transaction inside a block. And we <clears throat> can describe our transaction from where it comes, usually your wallet to your contract address. Remember, you will be calling your contract your contract method that you deployed before with a guess. I didn't enter a lot in the guess world of NFTs and blockchain because it's quite complex, but you can think of gas on blockchain literally as gas, as in the cars, it runs like blockchain runs on gas, Ethereum blockchain runs on gas. Everything that you do, you pay a small gas fee that's why we've, I've been avoiding saying the word guest before, but every time you send a transaction or you call your smart contract, you pay a small amount of gas fee. So people processing your, your request, your transaction request, will have this gas fee as their bounty. And inside your transaction, there is data that is the signature calling your method. In this case, we call the method safe mint will mint a new NFT to a given address and will pass as a parameter also the IPFS hash of our NFT describing its metadata. And then we can sign it when we call in the line 21, when it called the sign transaction, usually it'll pop the MetaMask plugin on your app so people can sign your transaction, they you use their private key to sign the transaction, <clears throat> proving that they are the ones like that triggered that transaction. Also, smart contract, most of the time, they have validations <clears throat> making only the owner of the contract that will be the only person be able to call the smart contract methods. And after that, we'll get the receipt that is your the result of your transaction and you finally have your NFT. So that's that's I, I, what I'm trying to explain to you guys, the basic concept and all the toolings you need to create an NFT. I expect that I could make you, your life a bit easier and give you a bit of understanding of what is a blockchain and what is an NFT. Vinny will give you the hands-on on creating an NFT. And I think we have plenty of time for questions. You probably have a lot of them because I think I went too fast on my presentation. So I'll give, I'll open the space for questions. It was so confusing that you can even make a question. Shame on me. <laughs> but don't don't worry, guys. It's it's super confusing. <laughs> Yeah, it's a lot of moving parts Nanny, to just make the thing like exist. Let me, maybe I can go back some. So yeah, we'll need all this moving part just to create an NFT. It's, it's a very complex process and it depends on the blockchain that it also a complex thing, so. If I ever tried working off with other blockchains, I've been working with <clears throat> Polygon, that it's a second layer blockchain. It's a blockchain that lives side by side with Ethereum. <clears throat> so it's basic Ethereum, but with a cheaper 
with a cheaper coin. So you can have like cheaper transaction fees and you will have like faster transactions also. One thing about blockchains and creating NFTs is it's, it's a expensive process because you pay this gas fee, this bounty for people to process your transaction and put it on the block and put it on the blockchain. And when you talk about, for example, Ethereum, it's a super expensive coin. Also, the, the Ethereum blockchain has a lot of people using it. It has a lot of traffic. And the more the traffic, the more is the more expensive transaction the gas fee gets. So it can be quite expensive to create <clears throat> NFTs on the Ethereum blockchain. And to create an you need to sell your NFT for a high price just to make it like more expensive than the gas fees. Do you have any idea of how much it costs to each transaction? Like in oh, I can let me see if I can go to the ether scan. I can give you the right number. Latest transaction. Well, the latest transaction on the on the Ethereum blockchain cost eleven dollars. It was a transaction sending where someone sent someone else some ether. So let me see if I can get a another one that is a bit more expensive. Again, transactions fee was eleven dollars. Right now it, it's around eleven dollars, but it depends on the network traffic. So it's a, it's quite expensive. Uh, I found here a transaction from a smart contract, the X Infinity. I think X Infinity. I think it's a game. I may be wrong, but I'm I'm almost sure that it's a game. And the transaction fee was almost hundred dollars <throat> because it was a big transaction. Probably, it's a smart contract and a big method that took a bit of a bit of time to run. And the gas fee is based on how much time the like the machine processing your transaction took to to do the processing. So it probably took some some time and it costs almost hundred dollar on gas fees. Nowadays, NFT has been used for a lot of stuff project already or is in a very early stage and how do we see it growing? It's quite popular, I can say this. There are a lot of big projects we have. For instance, OpenSea, that is a marketplace for people to create, like for common users to create their own NFT without knowing anything about software development. But we can check on Etherscan, for example, how much money do OpenSea pays on gas fee? Because every time someone goes to OpenSea and creates an NFT in their platform, they pay some gas fees. And I think we can check that on the Ethereum scan, on the Etherscan. Let me share my Etherscan, my Etherscan page for you guys. Just one second. I'm checking all this info here in the Etherscan. The nice thing about, or the not so nice, it depends on you, about blockchain is everything is public, so you can check. You can check everyone's transactions. So far, the median gas price is around ten dollars, and we can see. In, let me see where. I can find the people spending a lot of money. I think it's in here and I think it's in the guest tracker. Here we have it. And <clears throat> let me show you guys. Oh, that's a lack of security. Not actually, because you can change anything in the blockchain. You can track people, but you can, there's nothing you can do about it to change it. 
So it's almost impossible to change a transaction or to forge a transaction in the blockchain, especially in <laughs> proof of work blockchains to like to forge a transaction or to change to, to change a transaction in the blockchain, you need to have 51% of all the computer processor processing power of a given blockchain. So it's, it's impossible. And so right now, OpenSea, that it's probably someone you may know it, just paid in the last three years the 84 F coins. And it's worth in the last, ah, we have in here, gas fees in the last 24 hours. They paid 4 million and 853, <coughs> $387 in gas fees. So we can say that pro we have a lot of project and it's like, it's not in the early stages. People have been using NFTs and there's been spending a lot of money on NFTs. So yeah, it's it's, it's been growing. We've been seeing new blockchains like showing up we have flow blockchain which is super cool they have a different approach for the proof of work they have the proof of stake so if you own coins in the blockchain you are a trusty operator and you don't need to run a super complex puzzle so it's a lot more environmental friendly do you have an idea about how many computers are currently running blockchain? Is it possible to know? Uh, I have no idea, but I can say there is like a lot. There's people living on like what they call farms. People have like bunches of computers, even storage, like even whole buildings of computers, mining transactions for Ethereum, for Bitcoin. So I think, I don't know, man, around like billions of computers. I have no idea, but it's like I'm among us. It's like a ridiculous amount of computers running in this, like in the famous, the most famous blockchain. It, and it's a really good question. I would love to know. <coughs> Sorry, guys. Oh, and about if I've had been working with other blockchains, I work a bit with Polygon, that is Ethereum base, but also a bit of with, with Flow blockchain and Cardano blockchain and the Filecoin blockchain. Filecoin is a different approach, is a blockchain that's also used to store files as a IPFS. It's it's a double, it's like it's a double purpose blockchain. There is the Cardano blockchain that people expect to be one of the biggest proof of stake blockchains. Really cool, but I think it's still in the, the early stages. Yeah, Bitcoins are, I think there is the, let me see the Bitcoin. Yeah, not very. Yeah. Let me see the, the average cost of a Ooh, this one is ugly. <laughs> Let me go back. Here we have the Bitcoin Explorer. I would love to know the average, like, latest transaction, amount of Bitcoin. I was trying to look like how much, like in dollars people have been paying to, to, to start a transaction in the Bitcoin blockchain. Because I think 
it's even like more expensive than the Ethereum blockchain. Yeah, guys, let me see. Yeah, we still have 50 minutes. We can end it up early if, if you guys don't have any more questions. And if you have like additional questions, you can always reach me. You can send me an email. Let me, let me post it in, in here. Sure, me boy. Show me your biceps. Here they are. <laughs> so, blockchains, they have test nets. So, you can use it's it's a copy of the blockchain usually and but it's it's for free there are like faucets what they call when you can get some fake money and work with so you don't need to go live when you start like building your own your own nfts so for example let me go to i know that mumbai polygon scan it's a Mumbai is the test network for Polygon blockchain. So everything in here are test transaction running in a test network. And but it's just a, like it's a test environment for blockchains. It works uh, just as the same as the main network, but it's a test network. So the main difference is like there are fewer computers running it and there's a lot less traffic so you can transactions fees would, would like be lower but it's it's just the same it's a sandbox environment and there are for example the go to a faucet and get some fake money for your wallet and yeah, then you don't need to pay any, you're still paying gas fees, but with fake money. So something that you should be aware when working with testnet and mainnet is there's not a lot of traffic in the testnet as in the main network so when you put your app in production you may face some weird errors from the evm saying that your transaction was rejected or there's a lot of traffic and no one process your transaction because on testnet you can, you can work with very small gas fees you can be willing to pay very small amount of gas fees and because there's not a lot of traffic, someone will wind it up processing your transaction. But when you go live, you need to make sure that you pay enough like gas fees for, for the for people to process your transaction. That's the only main difference I can say. See, yeah, still have some extra time, guys. Oh, and if you're willing to start develop your own NFTs, you can find a lot of material in the Ethereum org. They have everything you need and you can use <clears throat> they didn't even have if i'm not mistaken a tutorial on how to write and deploy an nft so it's really cool let me post this link for you guys oh we'll probably we'll see they they link to MetaMask, Solidity, Hardhat, Pinata, Alchemy. <clears throat> and 
as Stephanie asked me before about marketplaces. So we have like big guys in here. We have some ridiculous transactions actually actually on NFTs. Like the Nian Cat example that was sold by millions, I think. Let me see. Really when you when you type what is an NFT? Pretty like here in the verge. Oh, the Crypto Kitties, one of the first big like players in the NFT world. Let me go here. Uh, usually they have some values. I know they have it. Oh, here we have some. Someone paid $390,000 for a 50 second video by Grimms. Other person paid 6.6 .6 million for a video by people. And I love the example of the Nian Cat. Let me see if they have it here in this article. Oh, you probably know this guy in here. So it was sold as an NFT for. Is it the right price? No. I would love to find the right price. Sorry, guys. Uh, sorry guys i couldn't find the right price but it was they sold it for a massive amount of money <laughs> and we all know this so there's a big market for this for sure 